My mother told stories about a place like this, a protected land with people that never have to leave. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and let's get right into it. Namor was right. Everything that he did was to protect his people who had already survived a genocide. So we're gonna look at how every decision Namor made in Wakanda Forever was in the best interest of his people and why attacking the surface world is the only way to protect Talakon. And we think that he will attack in phase six and that that attack will pit the Thunderbolts and the new Avengers team against each other in a secret Avengers movie that hasn't even been announced yet. But more on that in a bit. Remember, the MCU is a really harsh place right now and the governments of the world get shadier with every single movie hell valentina allegra de fontaine is running the thunderbolts let me rephrase that the director of the cia has her own superhero mercenaries hell we've even seen damage control overreaching to control powered people and i think all of this is going to come to a head very soon namor knows that he cannot hide his civilization forever and that literally everyone will come for his people and their vibranium the second they discover they exist as their leader it is his job to protect his nation oh yeah namor lives in Atlantis, right? Actually, Doug, Namor rules over Talakon. Atlantis is European, a fallen civilization first mentioned by Plato. Talakon, however, has its roots in Aztec culture. It's modeled after the first of the Aztecs' 13 heavens reserved for people who died by drowning. Now, in the MCU, Talakon is an underwater empire filled with vibranium. The people of Talakon originally lived on a land in the Yucatan Peninsula, but after colonizers ravaged their home with disease, a Mayan shaman found a plant similar to the heart-shaped herb. When they drank it, they gained the ability to breathe underwater and fled to the ocean to escape their oppression. Namor is the firstborn child of Talakon, and after his mother drank the plant while she was pregnant, he became a mutant with pointy ears, winged feet, and the ability to breathe on air and land. So let's really try to see the events of Wakanda forever from Namor's point of view. He ruled Talakon for hundreds of years and protected his people by keeping them totally secret. Talakons never messed with the surface world until they drilled into their land for vibranium. If a country drills into another country for a resource without permission, that's an act of war. But they didn't know. They thought it was just the ocean. You don't need to be killing people for that. Ah, uh, but remember, Namor's number one goal is protecting his people and the best way to do that is to keep them totally secret. Now killing everyone on the ship was extreme but it did guarantee that nobody could expose them. Also the blood of the people on the boat kind of on Wakanda's hands. When Wakanda revealed vibranium to the world, it put Talakon in a perilous situation. Every nation in the world now wanted access to this most precious resource, and what better place to look than under the sea? But Wakanda didn't even know Talakon existed. No, but Wakanda still endangered them. Your son exposed the power of vibranium to the world. In response, other nations have begun searching the planet for it. The vibranium detection machine raises the stakes for Namor. If the surface world built it once, they can build it again. So he has to find the scientist that made it, Riri. Yeah, and Namor wants to kill a college kid. That's not right. Well, look, it's more complicated than that. Namor doesn't want to kill Riri. He views her death as a necessity. It's important to remember that Namor isn't just a part of Talakon. He's their leader, a god, and a protector. His responsibility is with his people. And Riri, regardless of her age, is a threat. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Also, this reflects Namor's lack of trust in the surface world. Now, let's say, hypothetically, that he tried to reason with her, explain why she can't create this machine, and help her empathize with his people. It wouldn't matter because she wouldn't have a choice. Namor knows that the governments of the surface world will force her to recreate this machine. And he's not wrong. And yes, Riri is a kid who doesn't deserve to die, and murdering her would be awful. Nobody is arguing that child murder is a good thing. But Namor wouldn't even be the first superhero to kill, or try to kill, a kid because it was necessary. Drake Love's daughter was collateral damage. And we were all totally fine when Tony Stark brought a 15-year-old into a superhero civil war. I can't go to Germany. Why? I got homework. And do we even need to bring up King T'Chaka abandoning his nephew after killing his brother? I'm a child. We left him. Bad things have always happened to kids in the MCU when it was necessary. And if you're sitting in Namor's shoes, killing Riri is just a necessary but a terrible choice that he has to make. Now, Namor starts with violence, but then he really does try diplomacy. When his people find Riri, Shuri demands to go with her and meet their leader. I demand that you take me to Namor. Do not bring harm to this girl. And once she's in Talakon, she is treated with the utmost respect. She's given fancy regal clothing, and Namor even gifts her his mother's bracelet. She is a diplomatic guest. Namor explains Talakon's history to her to make her empathize with his point of view. So that you can understand why I have to kill the scientist. The stakes are really high. There is a life on the line, but this is pretty standard diplomacy. And sure, he gets that. She negotiates with him. What if we took her to Wakanda? And wants to know more about him and his people so she can understand him better. 
I'd love to see your nation. When Namor shows Shuri Talakon, he's so proud of what he and his people created. They have their own culture, transportation systems, greetings, games, and even their own sun. In the depths of the ocean, I brought the sun to my people. Namor is not showing off. He is exposing Talakon to Shuri so she understands what's at stake for him. I know you wished me to spare the life of the scientist, but now you see what I have to protect. They return to the surface world and have this beautiful heart-to-heart -heart about loss. Loss connects the two. They've both lost what's most important to them. And it's only then, when he knows Shuri understands, that Namor tries to ally with Wakanda in a war against the surface world. Now, we'll get into how Namor is totally right about the surface world attacking Talakon later in the video. But for now, all that's important is that Namor offered Wakanda a diplomatic alliance in good faith. And then, it all goes to shit. What do you mean? Well, Shuri, for some reason, didn't tell anybody she was going to Talakon. So, Wakanda thinks that she's been kidnapped and her life is in danger. And to be honest, I can't blame them. No one saw her agree to go. And it's not like she can text her mom. Or some of those damn text messages you're always sending out there? You know, hey, it's me, Casey, I'm not dead in a ditch. LOL, little picture of a Whale, hashtag YOLO. To rescue Shuri, Queen Ramonda lures Namor to the surface world and threatens to expose him. Return my daughter and the scientist, or I will inform them of your existence. She made the most serious threat possible, and Namor is transparent about what he'll do if she reveals them or tries to find Talakon. I will kill the princess, I will come to Wakanda, and I will kill you. At that exact moment, Nakia is in Talakon, saving Princess Shuri. And if that wasn't bad enough, she kills two guards. Right then, Shuri knows they're f***ed. Don't, don't understand. This will mean war. So, who's in the right here? Well, it's tricky. Is Queen Ramonda wrong for sending Nakia to get Shuri when she thought she was kidnapped? No. I mean, a Wakandan spy infiltrates Namor's kingdom and kills one of his people. Of course he sees that as an act of war. But, but somebody has to be wrong. I see the world in start, black and white terms. Eh, what can I say, dude? A lot of wars start because of lethal misunderstandings. I'm looking at you, World War I. <laughs> so Namor takes the murder of two of Talakon's citizens as an act of war and brings it. He also makes good on his threat to Queen Ramonda. But even then, he's still like... He's ready for war with the surface world, but he still doesn't want war with Wakanda. If he did, he would have continued the attack. Look at Namor's intentions. Unlike Shuri and Queen Ramonda, Namor's only goal is to protect his people. Before their attack, Namor takes responsibility for these two murders in a speech. <laughs> He's their protector, and if anybody's been hurt, it's his fault. Then he says, He couldn't protect all of his people, but he will protect their home. Is Namor angry? Yes, but he's not driven by anger. He's driven by a sense of duty. He's attacking Wakanda because their knowledge of Talakon is dangerous for Namor and his people. Wakanda and Talakon have to be allies or they will always be under threat. Whereas Shuri doesn't attack Namor to protect her people. Yes, her people are threatened, but her intention is very Vengeance. Nemo will beg me for mercy as I stand and watch as he dies. Now, I can't think of a nicer way to attack than giving the enemy seven days warning. And how does Wakanda respond? By creating a second vibranium detection device. They could have called him with the conch, but instead they recreated the biggest threat to Talakon. That's, I mean, that's not great. Right? It's an act of war. So Namor and his army go to the surface and the battle begins. Now, I'm not gonna delve too deep into it, but once Namor and Shuri are fighting head on, they're evenly matched. She's the Black Panther. He's weakened by dehydration. They're on the same level. Instead, I wanna focus on what they say to each other when they've one. After Namor stabs Shuri through the stomach, he says, It could have been different. The fight for him is always about his duty to protect his people. Hey, person, how did she survive that? Special Wakandan tech stuff. Anyways, when Shuri wins, she says, Vengeance has consumed us. We cannot let it consume our people. Now that's true for Shuri, but not for Namor. Namor doesn't like the surface world, but he isn't attacking for vengeance. If he was, he would have attacked a long time ago. Lord knows Talakon is strong enough to take vengeance on the colonizers who nearly made their tribe extinct. Namor is attacking now because he doesn't trust the surface world. For him, it's a collection of nations that would hurt his people, and again, he probably wouldn't be wrong. Then Namor yields to Shuri. Now he's worshipped as a god, and he bends the knee to someone from the surface world. Talk about an ego hit. And why does he do it? <laughs> He just got his ass handed to him, and still, he only cares about his people. In Wakanda Forever, Namor's actions are extreme, but they all make sense, and they're all done with one goal in mind, to protect Talakon. But moving on from that, his attacking the surface world plan isn't all that crazy. With the history of colonization, the shady governments, and the speed of technological innovation, a preemptive attack is the only way that Namor could protect his people. Oppression, colonialism, and genocide were already canon in the MCU. This isn't war. 
It's genocide. Now there's some historical context in Wakanda forever, but to really understand no more, we need to really understand the toll that colonization has taken on Mesoamerica. Unlike Wakanda, Namor's people could not hide from colonization. They escaped it, but the price was leaving their homes. And it was a great home. Prior to Spanish colonization, the Mayans had an advanced and beautiful empire. There were thriving urban cities with complex infrastructure like Chichen Itza and Usmao. They were extremely advanced in astronomy and math. They had accurate calendars spanning 5,000 years. Is that why everybody thought the world was going to end in 2012? According to our Mayan calendar, the world will be destroyed at the end of the 13th Baktun. Yes, well, to be clear, the Mayans didn't think that. We just decided the end of their calendar meant doomsday. They also used rubber, made chocolate, and had complex religion and social systems. Ursa, what happened? Well, a few things. The Mayan Empire originally declined because of civil war and ecological disaster. The Mayan civilization became decentralized. It didn't stop, but continued city to city instead of in a grand empire. But the biggest problem was the Spanish colonizers. The Spanish arrived at the Yucatan Peninsula, now part of Mexico, in 1527, and immediately said that all the land and people there were now Spanish. I claim this chest in the name of Spain. <laughs> But the Spanish military was weaker than the Mayans, so they couldn't set up a city in the region for 10 years. Or if they were weaker, how'd they take over? Well, you know what they spread in those 10 years? Disease. Not like the Europeans didn't give us anything, no, because they gave us typhus, cholera, malaria, measles. European diseases weakened the Mayan people until the Spanish could slowly take over, forcing them into villages called reducciones, sort of like reservations in North America. Then they enslaved them with the system called repartimento. That's probably where we saw Namor when he buried his mom. Also remember that a Catholic priest called Namor a child without love. Spanish man of faith cursed me as he died by my hand. He called me. It's not surprising that the colonizers also stripped away their religion, even putting crosses on their temples. Even though Namor didn't grow up in the Yucatan, everyone else in Talakan did. So he heard stories of their beautiful advanced society. But when he goes to the surface, it's gone. And even worse, the Mayan people are reduced to slaves. So he sees firsthand how much was lost, and he knows what can be taken from Talakan in the name of gathering resources. But that was such a long time ago. How does he know it'll be the same if they go public now? Yeah, that original colonization was a long time ago, but Western governments still interfere with Central America in ways that affect the Mayan people. Take the Guatemalan Civil War, for example. It began in the 1950s with a U.S.-backed coup and directly led to a Mayan genocide in the 80s. Namor is up on current events. He knew the Wakanda revealed itself, so he probably knows about this ongoing oppression. And that leads to another point in the MCU. Governments are sketchy. The president wants to take offensive action against Wakanda. What type of offensive action? Destabilization. And I love superheroes, but their existence has made governments a lot sketchier and legalities are a lot less clear. While it's good that they busted Hydra bases, it was definitely against international law. The Sokovia Accords tried to solve that problem, but government oversight did not work at all. But if this panel sends us somewhere, we don't think we should go. What if there's somewhere we need to go and they don't let us? Now, by the time of Wakanda Forever, the U.S. government is extremely shady. Val is the head of the CIA, and from what we know about the Thunderbolts, it seems like she's about to run a group of mercenaries. In WandaVision, we met the director of S.W.O.R.D., who is brutally aggressive and mainly concerned with creating sentient weapons. And that's not even mentioning Secret Invasion, where an alien race has infiltrated the highest offices of the land. Nothing about the government is transparent, especially if it involves vibranium. The leaders of the world are doing whatever it takes to get their own vibranium. The French sent mercenaries to a Wakandan outpost, and the U.S. secretly took plans from a 19-year-old girl. The U.S. also kept legally dubious vibranium for years. Valentina admits that Captain America's shield isn't even theirs. Here's a little dirty state secret doesn't really belong to the government. It's kind of a legal gray area. And S.W.O.R.D. shouldn't have had Vision's body. He made his posthumous wishes quite clear. And no matter what, S.W.O.R.D. cares more about the Vibranium than the fact that Vision was a living being. I cannot allow you to take $3 billion worth of Vibranium just to put it in the ground. I mean, I wish the United States wanted Vibranium for altruistic reasons, but it's clear that that's not the case. Ever thought what we would be doing if the U.S. was the only country in the world with Vibranium? actually dream about that. Namor knows that he cannot keep Talakan a secret forever. That was never the plan. He told his people that one day the surface world would find them and they'd have to attack. 
with the vibranium detection machine and Wakanda knowing their secret, that day is getting closer and closer. Ever since the Battle of New York introduced the world to alien technology, Earth technology has advanced rapidly, and better technology means that it's harder to keep secrets. Look at Wakanda and Vibranium. Wakanda didn't officially announce its tech until Black Panther, but the Avengers already knew. After all, it was never a secret that their original stores of Vibranium came from Wakanda. I don't follow what comes out of Wakanda. The strongest metal on Earth. They just thought that Howard Stark got everything out. But in Age of Ultron, it's revealed that Claw also stole Vibranium and earned a brand that meant thief in Wakandan. Hell, in Iron Man 2, we see that S.H.I.E.L.D. was already monitoring Wakanda, so they probably knew too. Wakanda does not immediately reveal their technology until Civil War. Now, if you're trying to keep your society on the DL, running around in a super technologically advanced cat suit with vibranium claws and trying to kill the guy who murdered your leader isn't the smartest way to do it. And that's not even getting into how ready Claw is to talk. You're telling me that weapon on your arm is from Wakanda? Wakanda chose to reveal their tech, but they also couldn't have kept it secret much longer. It made more sense for them to come forward on their own terms than to wait to be discovered. But the key difference between Wakanda and Talakan is that Wakanda was already recognized as a country. The rest of the world knew they existed, just not the extent of their technological power. Though it remains one of the poorest countries in the world, fortified by mountain ranges and an impenetrable rainforest. Now this meant that Wakanda had legal protections. They were recognized as a sovereign nation and were even part of the UN. And still, countries attacked them for their vibranium. Talakan has no legal protections. How could they? No one knows they exist, and they can even be classified as inhuman since they don't breathe air. A perceived lack of humanity was part of the problem in the original colonization of the Maya. The Spanish justified their treatment by saying they were less human because they weren't Christian. Because Namor's people are even more different, they could face the same issue. So, what can Namor do? Talakan can't stay hidden for much longer. If they come to the surface world in peace, they'll be attacked for their resources and will have no legal framework protecting them. They only have one option. Show that they're too strong to be messed with by staging a preemptive attack. Both in the real world and in the MCU, there is a delicate geopolitical balance. That's how the world works. And things that disrupt that balance don't go over well. That's partially why Wakanda's getting attacked. They were a third world country who suddenly catapulted to the most advanced country in the world. And one of the things keeping them safe is their military power. The Dora Milaje made a show of the French mercenaries to scare other nations. No country on earth will outright attack Wakanda because they know they'll lose. If Wakanda's military might is their biggest protection, the same is true for Talakan. But Talakan cannot display their strength unless they attack first. If they wait to be attacked, it's already too late. They're looking at the same situation as before. If they can assert their might early, they can scare other governments into leaving them and their vibranium alone. Also, Wakanda's initial reaction to them didn't do a lot to soothe the Moors' fears. If there is one country in the world that should have understood them from the start, it was Wakanda. And while they eventually got there, Vengeance has consumed us. We cannot let it consume our people. The time it took doesn't bode well for Talakan. So what if this attack on the surface world is planned for phase six? And what if it happens in a Secret Avengers movie? Oh, like the Secret Avengers comic books? That'd be so cool. No, no, not like the Secret Avengers comics, but an Avengers movie in Phase 6 that they have kept secret that Marvel hasn't announced yet. What? We've had all this build up for Young Avengers, yet there's no Young Avengers project in sight, unless Avengers the Kang Dynasty is actually Young Avengers the Kang Dynasty. And this would make sense because the Young Avengers origins tie in very closely to Kang the Conqueror. A teenage version of Kang did join the team. Oh, so there's not going to be like a grown-up Avengers movie? There is. I think there's an unannounced Avengers Avengers movie that takes place after the Thunderbolts. So, after Secret Invasion, the US government will have one big question. How did the world's heroes let Skrulls take over? And how do they stop this from happening again? And we know that Thunderbolt Ross is going to become President Ross in Captain America Brave New World. And this guy has a history of superhero oppression. So, as the new leader of the free world, he will go to any lengths to ensure American security. That will be the focus of Captain America Brave New World. Now, Brave New World is actually a reference to Aldous Huxley's 1931 dystopia novel where everything's been mechanized and there's only one massive government called the world state. My guess is that in this new movie, Ross is going to start expanding the US government to being a single world government, similar to the world state. And the Thunderbolts are going to play a part in that. Now, Sam was not Steve's best friend for nothing. He believes deeply in freedom and there's no way he's going to let an authoritarian regime take over without a fight. So in response to Ross forming a one world government, Sam forms a new Avengers. But members of the Thunderbolts, Bucky, John Walker, Yelena, Taskmaster, 
Taskmaster, Red Guardian, and Ghost would already be on the United States side. So just like Civil War, the Earth's mightiest heroes are split. And that is where the Secret Avengers movie comes in. After Thunderbolts, Ross attacks Wakanda and New Asgard for not bending the knee and giving up their sovereignty. Namor sees his chance to force an allyship with Wakanda and New Asgard, so he attacks the U.S. While the U.S. and the Thunderbolts are fighting Wakanda, Talakon, and New Asgard, the New Avengers are just trying to stop the war. And when Kang shows up, no heroes are free to stop him except for, boom, the Young Avengers. It's all happening. But that's just a theory. What we know for sure is that Namor was justified. Both the villains and the heroes of Wakanda Forever are nuanced, and the entire movie points to the same problem that Falcon and the Winter Soldier did. The governments of the MCU are untrustworthy. Now, it seems like they all came together for a while during the blip, but once everybody came back, this alliance fell apart. And now, every government is trying to protect and arm themselves. Now, while we want there to be a clear-cut good guys and bad guys, it's mostly just people trying to protect themselves and their own interests. And Namor is one of them. He knows that he isn't invincible, and he knows that his empire isn't either. He has seen firsthand an empire's destruction because of the greed of men, and he knows they'll do it again. If he preemptively strikes, then he can defend his people rather than being a sitting duck and waiting for the world to discover him. But that's just our thoughts. What do you guys think? Is Namor justified? Will Ross form a one world government? Will the Young Avengers lead the Kang Dynasty? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.